Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 81, we're going to talk some more about how to achieve great sound by talking about the first song. But first caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Now, when it comes to achieving great sound, your ears, brain, and listening experience are critical tools. When you install a new piece of audio equipment, you've probably already formed an opinion on how it will sound and what improvements you are expecting. But the most important moment to evaluate the sound is that first song you play. Why the first song is so important is you haven't yet forgotten what the system sounded like before you made the change, and now you'll be able to immediately hear the difference. Maybe three songs later, an hour later, and you'll think, this is the way the system always sounded. Fantastic! <laughs> now, it's important when you choose your first song that you choose something you like. It's also important that it's well recorded and that the resolution is fairly high. And that doesn't mean it can't be analog. And up first I've got Shelby Lynn's Just a Little Loving. Now I just put this in first because one of our test builders used that as his first track. And he chose carefully and he chose a reissue analog productions remastered LP totally in the analog domain so analog recording so from tape analog mixing and remastering analog re record pressing so it never goes into the digital domain that's something that you'll hear me talking about time and time again there's nothing wrong with digital recordings but if it was originally an analog recording try and stay analog remember our systems are analog our ears are analog vocals a singer that's analog a pluck of a guitar string that's all analog digital is just a convenience it doesn't necessarily sound better okay but some Digital can. DSD in particular, high resolution DSD. Okay, now I'm not going to go over every single one of these tracks, but I'm going to drop in occasionally and we'll look at something. So one of my standard test tracks that I use is, is the really wonderful Fiend Brothers Play Brubeck album. It's a one microphone recording. It was done in high resolution DSD and for an acoustic, a solo acoustic baseline, an upright baseline to test my my system for acoustic bass. Unsquare Dance is a great track for that. It's just perfect. In fact, the whole album is filled with high resolution. If you're a fan of 1950s jazz, um, and who isn't, Brubeck was truly a master uh, composer and um, extraordinary um, pianist. Uh, along with um, one of the greatest uh, jazz groups in history. And we're not going to go too much in detail or we'll get lost <laughs> down a rabbit hole. Anyways, I highly recommend this one microphone recording. Eva Cassidy's Ain't No Sunshine is very similar to Shelby Lynn. I use these for uh, female vocal mid-range testing. They're just warm, rich sounding, uh, and I I like them, so particularly of a Cassidy. Nora Jones' live album, Till We Meet Again, every single track on this album was well recorded, and I love Nora, so <laughs> that's highly recommended. The Who, live in Hyde Park. Now, I'm a huge Who fan going way, way back to, you know, when the original albums were coming out. Damn, I'm that old. Um, now, not the first ones, thank God. But um, I can remember when some of them came out, there was, you know, people were, I don't remember lining up for a Who album, but I remember racing to the store. <laughs> it 
get them before the albums would sell out you know you'd have a first release of something and if you weren't there on day one or two forget it buddy anyways a lot of early rock in fact early analog recordings were badly done that i mean that's that's the simple fact of the matter somewhere in the signal chain um they dropped the ball the who even though they were you know um uh, first rank rock band let's call them so the recordings were as well done as they could they, they still you know they, they're not that good a lot of the early stuff and the later material is not really my favorite who stuff so when they when they recorded this live in Hyde Park in 2015 wow the recording is amazing sure it's digital but so what it's uh it's a well done digital recording in high resolution and it's the best i've ever heard the who sound annette liberty wow her vocals just come out of this black space uh, a deep space background in which there's not a sound to be heard this is just stunning. I love this. A lot of these tracks were first brought to my attention from good customers who happen to be audiophiles and tube lovers. And they'll share with me their first track, their first song, or their test tracks. And a lot of the music's not to my taste, um, but some of them will just stick and I'll listen to them over and over again. They'll become my test tracks or my first song. London Grammar, Hey Now. Wow, this is just a great... It's just a great pop song, a modern pop song, and it, it, you know, the recording is just superb. Sure, it's digital, but it's an extremely good digital recording. Anwar Braham, World Jazz, uh, ECM recordings, uh, what, what else, acoustic, uh, mostly small uh, live venues. Um, it's probably one of the only artists in the world that I would try and fly in to see. Um, and it's on, it's on my bucket list. I don't have much of a bucket list, but this is on my bucket list. Um, if you have a class A system, um, that loves, uh, acoustic jazz, my goodness, anything by Anwar Abraham. If you like modern world jazz, I'm not talking about avant-garde. I'm just talking about slow and thoughtful melodic music. These guys, wow. And he plays with some of the world's best players. Not only is he a great a composer and instrumentalist in his own right, he brings along uh, a complete package. Everybody who plays with him is superb. I saved one of my favorite albums for last, Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, or D-S-O-T-M, as people like to write in forums is a seminal progressive rock album. It's an amazing recording. Unfortunately, most of what you've probably heard has been taken from the analog tapes, which were mostly worn out by the time they were ripped to digital and then cleaned up and repressed on vinyl or made a visible, no, made a visible, <laughs> made available as a digital download or whatever. And frankly, those suck. Sure, they're low noise, but there's very little in the way of dynamics. A lot of the recording just disappeared with age. It's probably the master tapes and the safety and safeties were probably the most um, played and ripped master tapes in history after Kind of Blue. Um, so how do, how do you listen to this in its true form? Well you get as close to the original first press as you can find. So it's got to be in vinyl. And the only way I know to do that affordably is to go and find a quad, co co <laughs> a quad pressing. This is an SQ disc, so it was quadraphonic. Let me back up. This is a, way bigger than that sheet of paper. And the thing about this, pressing is that Pink Floyd thought in quad. They A lot of their concerts were performed in quad. That's how they set up the PA. And this was, this is the first UK press. That's what you want in either stereo or in quad. And, and yes, you can play a quad recording on a stereo system. The mix is different. In some ways it's better. In some ways it's a little weird. 
but what you get is as close to the master tapes as you can. This was pressed in the same year as the UK first stereo. I'm going to keep repeating that. The detail on this is unbelievable. There's things on this record that if you if you love progressive rock, you've listened to this a thousand times. There's things on a good revealing system that you will hear for the first time. And it's not because of the quad mix. It's just because this is such a good, close copy of the actual recording. This is probably better than the quad master tapes. They just, all those master tapes just deteriorate and deteriorate. Every time you play a tape back, you lose a few decibels of your actual tape. You, the tape literally starts to wear the minute you play it. So you can imagine how many times the stereo master tapes um, were played to make safeties and duplicates and on and on. Anyways, highly recommended if you can find one affordably. I got really lucky and found it at my local record show. Uh, I was a vendor at the time, so I got, we, we get, the vendors get the first half hour free range <laughs> before the hordes descend upon us. And um, I actually had the nerve to bargain for this, so I got it at a very good price. I'm ashamed to say, <laughs> not. Um, well, maybe I should be. Anyways, what's happening over at Melatone Kits? Hang on. Well, the Universal Preamp Kit Build Number One is nearing completion. And in fact, one of the test builders raced ahead of me, got ahead of the build build video series, and finished and um, and sent me a, uh, a recording, a video recording of his first song being played. And uh, it was lovely. It was just a great experience. I mean, I could almost feel his excitement through the video. And he has a great system. And, you know, the sound quality on my little computer speakers really doesn't do it justice, but it sounded good. <laughs> so we'll have to wait for his review. Um, all that's left to do is the trickiest bit. Now, these are dual mono designs, and so essentially you have two preamps in one envelope. And I've talked about this over and over again. That's, in my opinion, this is the topology you want for a preamplifier, whether it's a phono preamp, or in this case, this is a line or a line control preamp. It just basically controls the inputs and the volume, That's which is all you want. So it's a hybrid design. It uses PCBs or printed circuit boards to handle the power supply boards and to handle the fairly busy uh, preamp boards. But it also uses high quality point to point wiring techniques to handle things like the RCA signal in. So these will all be hand wired point to point to the volume pot, to the boards, and then from the boards to the pair of RCA outs. So it's a good compromise and it allows us to have a fairly compact chassis and a very high quality sound as a result of the hybrid design. Okay, now I wanna give a big shout out. I do this fairly regularly, but it's well warranted this time. Uh, the test builders for the Universal Preamp have been immensely ha helpful. Uh, you know who you are. The comments during the build helped me um, pick up little tiny errors in the, in the actual layout or assembly. And the comments later on as to how the pre sounded helped sell kits, frankly. Um, a good, a, I don't advertise, so a good review uh, will make or break a kit. And most importantly, I get comments from, from people about whether I'm short a little bit on some wire or a suggestion about something for the kit. Those things all immensely help improve the kits and just bring them that one step better than they are as, as the prototypes, basically. Okay, thanks to our test builders. We couldn't, we couldn't do this without you. Okay, 
What came in this week? This is my favorite part of every episode. Now, you know I'm passionate about tubes. Let's get these things all arranged. I'm going to save the best to last, as always. Now, thousands of tubes are coming in. Let's zoom in here so you can see this. Um, because we've got a lot of KidAmp prototypes that are in development all at the same time. Eventually, we're going to have to start to really focus. I think Charles and I have to have a business meeting, but I think we're probably going to focus on the phono preamp and the headphone preamp, uh, preamplifier or amplifier. Headphone amplifier, yeah. Well, it's a preamp and an amp. So it's an integrated headphone amplifier. <laughs> to be precise. Anyways, they're all using interesting tubes and tubes that are available and affordable. That's good. That's the focus of Melatone kits is to bring you quality kits that use affordable tubes in most cases. Sometimes there's a high quality vintage tube I just have to use in a design, in which case there's no getting around the fact that the tubes will be expensive. But most of the kits, the tubes will be affordable. Okay, enough yapping, Jim. What came in? Well, some beautiful Sylvania 6SN7 GTAs, angled plates, nice big chrome domes. I got a couple of match pairs in the store. I don't find a lot of these at the same time and matching up pairs. So if I find, let's say, 12, if I get two pairs in the store, that's, that's success. <laughs> And um, finding 12 all in one place is rare. What else came in? Well, an earlier version of these tubes, new old stock NOS, new in the box NIB, and I've never had one of these, I believe, in its original box. Oftentimes, sellers, hang on, I gotta find my knife. Oftentimes, sellers will find a box and throw a tube in but often the box is not correct to the tube. In this case, we got lucky. And for the first time, I'm able to show you an original box from the 1950s. Sylvania's boxes from 1950s on look very similar. Um, you know, the patina really is one of the few things that changed. I love the boxes. The yellow-black is just a classic combination. Have a look at this. This is the 6SN7 GTA straight plate. Mint, new old stock. How do we know it's mint? Well, it's testing really good. A nominal 100, 100 would be um, the center value for new old stock. New old stock on my tester can be anywhere from 80 to about 120. So 100 is sort of the center value, and this is sitting almost right on top of it. But there's other cues that we can use to identify tubes, their condition, whether they've seen some service life, hard life. And one of the most important is the gettering. Is it full or does it show a white line? How big a loss of the gettering do we have? My general rule for a used vintage tube is I want to see at least two thirds of the getter intact. It's at that point that tube still has probably a lot of life left in, in it. Remember, the gettering absorbs stray molecules, gas molecules. They get are first trapped in here when the tube's made, but later on slip in. Remember down here where the wires come out of the base for the pins? All that glass is molten, it's pinched off. Some tubes are pinched off at the top with molten glass. And some of the gettering is used up right away when the tube is made and the getter is first flashed. But most of the wear you'll see is over time or through hard use. So that's a good indicator. And of course, it, if this tube was showing a white line of significance, that would show that the, the gettering was working on maintaining the vacuum. But I wouldn't sell this as a new old stock tube anymore. I would put this in as a used tube. The other thing we can look at besides the overall condition, is the pins. And I'm going to get them up close so you can look at them. If this is true new old stock, the pins better look new. Now, they can show some signs of having been on a test here a couple of times, because they have. 
maybe once at the factory, maybe two or three times over the span of the last 70 plus years. Now, what makes these things so valuable is that they were probably only made in one or two years in the early 1950s. And they are the first uh, generation of modern Sylvania 6SN7 after the famous bad boys, the lower spec GTs. And this is in my top three tubes. This version, which came right after and had a longer production run, it's more affordable, sounds very similar. I'd give a small edge to the earlier version. In many cases, the earlier tubes are the better sounding tubes, but they're also often, the they don't test as well, they're not as available, they're more expensive, uh, they'll be more prone to noise. So get the best testing tubes you can as early as you can, and don't worry too much about it. Not everybody can afford these. These are a little more accessible, they're still expensive. And if you can't afford these, the next version up, the 6SN7 GTB, are in the same family and sound very similar and are great sounding tubes as well. And of course, Sylvanias have a house sound. And the house sound is a warm, rich sound with good detail. And all the small signal tubes that Sylvania made share that same house sound. Well... If you stay to the very end, here are some discount codes to help you out. Remember, I've got flat rate shipping of $20 around the world. And if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on me, folks. And one little piece of uh, caretaking. If you're new to my store, you're going to... I ship rapidly. I don't fool around with people's orders. If I can't ship your order the next day or the same, sometimes the same day, but normally it's the next day, I send you an email. And I send a follow-up email with every order with the shipping details and the tracking number. So look in your spam box if you're a new customer because I keep getting, I had a lot of new customers over the last two months um, as store sales doubled during the great uh, tube shortage of 2022. And a lot of them, um, of course, don't correspond with me, so my correspondence ends up in your spam box. So, check your spam box, folks. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Valves and More signing off. Cheers, everyone!